this week when I learned that I would have the gift of being in front of you. I was not here in Charlotte, and so I couldn't go through my customary routines. I couldn't go to the library. I couldn't read a stack of 11 books. Um, so I just had to pray. Um, what would the Lord want to say to our congregation in this moment? Um, and I heard the words, we walk by faith and not by sight. As we stand on the cusp of a new season, I thought I heard the Lord telling us that it was time to study salvation. We walk by faith and not by sight. That comes from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth in the fifth chapter. And I am going to read that to you now. Um, let us listen together for God's words to us on this day. Paul writes to his church, We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than is what is in the heart. For if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, your ways are not our ways. And we are so content to worship a shadow of a shadow of a shadow of your glory. God, open our eyes to the wonder of your salvation. Have your way in us, Lord. Speak. We are your servants. Amen. Church, I wonder what salvation means to you. I wonder what you picture in your head, what you imagine when you hear the word salvation. I wonder if your understanding of salvation is formed by your vision or by God's. I wonder if to you being saved means being blessed and being safe and being powerful and everything going your way here and now. I wonder if being saved means to you that now you can do whatever you want because you're already and eternally forgiven. So the rules don't apply to you. You're free and favored and you don't owe anybody anything because Jesus paid it all. You're not a sucker. You're not your brother's keeper. You're not responsible for anything but living your best life. And after that, it'll be mansions and glory and heaven's most exclusive gated community all the way into eternity. Or I wonder if when you picture the word salvation, it looks more like the words that Jesus first spoke when he introduced himself and his realm, his kingdom in his first sermon. When he walked into a synagogue, into a gathering of faithful people who had dedicated their lives to God and were sure that they knew what God was doing. And Jesus walked right in there and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me that's what the word Messiah means, anointed me as Savior. How? Jesus says, he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, jubilee, a cosmic reset so that once again, all God's creation is shalom. I wonder when you think about salvation, when you think about salvation, which vision first floats up into your subconscious? Your vision of everything going your way? Or the second, God's vision of what God is doing in Christ, in creation, saving, restoring, liberating, the great reversal that the prophets foretold. I wonder when you think of salvation, if you think of it as a time when you get everything you deserve or a time when God gets everything God wants. I wonder if we can be brave and humble enough to consider that what we want, that what seems right in our eyes, and what God wants and what is righteousness might not be the same thing. I wonder when you think of salvation, are you at the center of that story or is God? The words I just read to you were written by Paul to a church that he had planted in Corinth. And if we judge by the letters we have in scripture, that church in Corinth was the church that challenged him the most and the one that held the deepest place in his heart. Corinth was a large port city, and in that city were people of every culture, every class, every ethnicity, every status, and out of them, through the Spirit, God had called together a tiny little community that was proclaiming and living new life, new culture in Christ. They were struggling to live together and love one another as if the kingdom of God were already in their midst. They believed that it was. And so they struggled and risked and served to come, overcome every barrier that divided them and to live in shalom, mutual flourishing with one another, to be reconciled to each other and to be reconcilers to their neighbors, to their enemies. 
Paul preached salvation like Jesus preached and lived salvation. Paul, who had been God's enemy and was rescued and made new by Jesus. And Paul formed other people so that they would be made new in Christ, so that they would be good news to the poor and freedom for prisoners and sight for those who were blind and didn't even know it and liberation for the oppressed. In the family of God, it is always the year of Jubilee. And we know from reading the two letters that Paul wrote to the church that Paul in Christ founded that community. He preached the gospel. He gave them that vision. And then once they were thriving, or at least once they were struggling with the right kind of struggles, he left to continue on sharing the word and the way and planting new congregations. And after Paul left, others came to say, hey, this is all wrong. Other preachers came to say, hey, you Christians, you are making a spectacle of yourselves. You look like fools. You are putting all of us in danger. Just calm down. Quit upsetting everybody with your liberation, new creation talk. Just be safe and enjoy your blessings. And why are you letting that fool, Paul, tell you what the kingdom of God looks like? Because just look at his life. He's getting arrested and beaten all the time. He's poor. He's miserable. He still has to work making tents. Does that look like abundant life to you? So why are you letting him be your teacher? God isn't with him. And the proof is, proof is that he's cursed. He's getting suffering all the time. He's going to get himself killed. He is out of his mind. So quit all this world-changing nonsense and settle down and let God bless you and focus on your own good life. And the community, understandably, was confused and persuaded that maybe there was an easier way, a less costly way, a less dangerous and sacrificial way. And so they write to Paul and they say, is it possible that you have preached us the wrong gospel? If we follow Jesus and Jesus has overcome the world, then shouldn't our lives be easier now? Shouldn't we have more blessings, more wealth, more admiration? Shouldn't we be honored? Shouldn't we be rewarded here and now? Don't these guys who have come in here have a point? If we are doing it right, then why aren't we being rewarded? Why isn't God blessing you? If Jesus overcame all the powers and principalities and sin and death and you follow him, then why do you look like such a loser all the time? Why are you suffering Why are you despised? Why are you so vulnerable? And if that is salvation, do we even want it? And Paul writes them back in the whole second letter to the Corinthians. And you could spend a whole year in the one chapter that I read, and obviously we won't. But what Paul is saying is that I, that he needs the church to see that these other guest preachers, they have it all wrong. That our confidence that we have eternal life in Christ with God should make us fearless in confronting and challenging the powers and principalities of this world. And we should be willing to risk and willing to suffer and willing even to die, never to kill, but willing even to die because we have seen the righteousness of God. Because we have, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., been to the mountaintop. And we know what is coming and it is glorious and it can never be taken from us. So we will no longer be tricked into fighting and snarling over crumbs of goodness and thinking that our neighbors are our enemies because we know the end of the story. All brokenness and ill evil has been overcome and we have this treasure and it can never be taken from us. So no one can shut us up. No one has any power to stop us. If your greatest threat is to take our lives, it's not a threat at all, Paul says, because we know this earthly tent that we live in, even if you could destroy it, we know we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And that makes us free and fearless to be about our father's business, which is goodness and abundant life for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind and liberation for the captives, new creation. That's what Paul was about. Not at being successful in the world that is, but new creation. And that's what his church bore witness to. All the divisions overcome, enmity destroyed, needs met, and resources shared. 
in the church of Jesus Christ, salvation no longer means I get what I need, but together we discover we have enough in Christ. Together we discover that we are being swallowed up, not by death, but by life. And in the presence of God, we have the spirit. And that is just the beginning, just the down payment on what God is doing in creation. Therefore, Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. We who see the glory of God revealed in the cross. So we know that there's a difference between what something looks like and what it is. Because that moment of Christ crucified, it looked like Jesus destroyed. It looked like Jesus was being overcome by the powers of this world. But what it really was, was the overcoming. That moment that looked like death and sin won was actually the moment of defeat. And what looked like shame was actually glory. Paul is saying, we see what God is doing here. We see what is coming to pass and we are confident in God's salvation. We have faith. And so our only desire is to please Jesus. And we are not afraid because we are in love with the goodness of God. And so if that looks like we're out of our mind, it's because our minds have been renewed in Christ in a way that does not make sense in this world that's passing away. And we are pouring ourselves out in love for our siblings. We know that doing that is beautiful to God, even if it looks foolish to the world. We are compelled by Christ's love, Paul says, which is seen most clearly on the cross. We discount shame. Paul says, I'm pouring my life out, not for condemnation, but for the salvation of enemies. Paul says, here's what compels me. Jesus died for all. So that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him, for Christ. And what does that look like to be part of salvation? Jesus told us from the beginning, the salvation that is and is coming from God is good news to the poor. It's freedom for the prisoners. It's sight for the blind. It's liberation for the oppressed. And Paul says, I'm doing that. And that might look foolish to you and to your guest preachers, but it is the wisdom of Christ, and I am unashamed of it. I am sent out into the world no longer to see things as the world sees them, as the culture sees them. I no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view because Paul says, I know how wrong that is. Because I once saw Jesus from a worldly point of view. And now I know that if anyone comes into Christ, they're like me. They're new creation. They're part of this new creation, part of this good news, shalom and freedom, liberation and the grand reversal, this upside down kingdom. The old ways of seeing and being and counting and judging are gone. The new has come. And this isn't something we are doing. This is what God is doing. Reconciling the world, the whole creation, the cosmos to God's self. Putting it right again. And we are the ones who have stopped resisting and started trusting and believing in the power and the beauty of the goodness of God. We walk by faith and not by sight. God could have judged the world. God could have judged and counted all our sins against us, but God didn't. God chose to heal and make the world righteous again by pouring out Jesus' righteousness on us. And so Paul says we make the same choice, not to count sins, not to hold wrong against people, not to judge that some people are too far gone and not worth it. God is a reconciler, and we choose to be part of God's reconciliation. And Paul's grand finish to his church is this, be reconciled to God, get on board with what God is doing. And then he says something astonishing. He says, God made Christ who had no sin to be the receptacle, the target, the recipient of all of our sinfulness so that in Christ, we might be the righteousness of God. Now, this is a revelation that is just too great for our human minds to actually understand, I think. But I notice that we spend a lot of time 
thinking about and wondering about and being confused by the idea that Christ, who had no sin, could be made sin. And what does that mean? And what are the mechanics? But we spend very little time taking seriously and thinking about and imagining and wondering the second half of that verse. What does it mean to believe that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the righteousness of God? Well, I suppose that depends on what you think God's righteousness looks like. If you think that God's righteousness looks like God sitting safe and high and mighty and removed from us in heaven, if you think that God's righteousness is expressed by God looking down on the world to judge it, if you think that God's righteousness is disgusted by the sin and wretchedness of creation and just wants to be separated from it until it can be destroyed, if that's what you think God's righteousness looks like, then being God's righteousness in your life will look like separating yourself from those you think are beneath beneath you, casting judgments on others, keeping count of their sins, enjoying your blessings and your special status, and letting other people get what they deserve while you eat your popcorn? Or do you believe the words of Jesus, the anointed Messiah Savior? Do you believe that he is the authority on what the righteousness of God looks like? Do you believe that he was telling the truth when he said... I am here to bring good news to the poor, release for the captives, sight for the blind, and liberation for the oppressed. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Not someday in some other place, but today, this righteousness has been fulfilled in your hearing. Do you believe that salvation starts at some later time in some later place for some people? Or do you believe that ever since Christ came, we have been living in the now of new creation? Yes. 60 years ago this weekend, the March on Washington happened. And the March on Washington was actually the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Because it was about salvation here and now. Good news for the poor, release for the captives, sight for the blind, and liberation for the oppressed. Some of you were around then. Some of you remember what you thought. Plenty of Christians thought like the guest preachers at the church in Corinth. What's the matter with you people? Keep your head down. Stop causing trouble. Stay in your lane. Don't risk your life. Let things just be how they are, and God will take care of things later. If you're blessed, it's because God's on your side. If you're not, it's because you're not on God's side. But there were some believers then of all ethnicities who said, no, the kingdom of God is and has been in our midst. It is here and now. And so we are not allowing these systems to stay unchallenged. God is liberating us and we see what is coming. And the powers that are against us are nothing compared to the power that is in within us. And we delight in being part of the righteousness of God. There were believers like Paul, like Medgar Evans, who Evers, who said, I will not lie and play small to protect this earthly tent of my life, because even if it is destroyed, I know that I have a heavenly house that was not built by human hands, and I know that the righteousness of God cannot be defeated or delayed, and it cannot be stolen from me, and I will have it here and now all the way into eternity. Yeah. Salvation is not just coming, church. If we believe Jesus, then we believe that salvation is here. And the question for us is, is there any evidence of that salvation in our lives and in our community? Those who are a part of Christ's new creation are history makers, are history shapers. In them and through them, God transforms what is into what will be. What was in the beginning is now and ever shall be. Those who are alive in Christ do not spend their time protecting their own lives. They do not live for their own sake, but they allow the salvation of God to be made manifest in their choices, even if that looks like foolishness to the world. If we are part of Christ's new creation, then we will take risks that will not make sense to those who do not know Christ. 
We will make sacrifices that will look foolish. And we will proclaim truths that offend powers and principalities. Because we know that a day is coming when Christ is triumphant. And all people will be reconciled to God and one another. And death and enmity and sin are no more. And every one of us has daily bread. And in Christ, we know that that day is today. Hallelujah. Amen.